Welcome to DLS 105, Risk Tools and Calculations for Risk Assessments. My name is Damon Amlung with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Risk Management Center. I will be presenting Module 1, Essential Elements of Probability Theory and of Entry Analysis. After completing this module, participants should be able to identify and describe the basic principles of probability and statistics, subjective probability, event tree development, and combining risk estimates. This presentation will cover basic terminology, set theory and Venn diagrams, and binomial theorem before getting into event trees and combining event probabilities. Let's start with some terminology. Risk is a measure of the probability and severity of undesirable consequences. For dam and levee safety risk assessments, these undesirable consequences can be associated with life safety, economics, or non-monetary consequences like environmental destruction. Of these different sets of consequences, life safety is paramount and the primary factor that guides our decision-making process for dams and levees. In a risk assessment, we assess the probability of failure, which will be a function of the hazard, hydrologic or earthquake, and the structure's performance. Then we consider the consequences of failure, which will be a function of who or what is downstream at the time of breach inundation, and the amount of inundation that results. For our purposes, FEMA's definition for dam and levee failure is used. Failure is characterized by the sudden, rapid, and uncontrolled release of impounded water. To reiterate, dam and levee safety risk will be a function of the hazard and its likelihood, the estimated performance of the structure given the hazard, and the expected consequences. The consequences will be a function of who or what are in harm's way, how susceptible to harm they are, and how much harm is ultimately caused. This figure illustrates the three components that make up the risk equation, hazard, performance, and consequences. Probability is a measure of the degree of belief in what we are predicting based on the information or evidence that we have. What we are predicting are uncertain events that occur in the future. Probability can also be an estimate of the likelihood of the magnitude of an uncertain quantity in addition to the likelihood of the occurrence of an uncertain event. One of the rules that we discuss here, and we'll discuss again when we get into event trees, is that a probability must have a value between zero and one no less and no more. If something has a probability of zero, it cannot happen and is impossible. And if something has a probability of one, it is certain to occur. There are two main interpretations of probability, subjective probability and statistical. Subjective probability is what we most often consider during a risk analysis and is a quantified measure of belief or judgment in the likelihood of the outcome we are evaluating. We do this by considering all available information we have, hopefully with a minimum level of bias. Subjective probability is affected by the state of understanding of a process, the judgment regarding an evaluation, and the quality and quantity of information, all of which can change over time as the state of our knowledge changes. This change in knowledge could be the result of subsurface investigations and drilling or material testing. It could also be the result of performance observations. Perhaps an embankment is loaded by a stage it has never experienced before, or perhaps seepage and erosion are observed during loadings where neither had occurred before. These observations can obviously change the probability we might estimate for a given event. Statistical probabilities can be thought of as the outcome of a repetitive experiment. Such statistical probabilities are covered in the best practices training course and are used heavily by the Bureau of Reclamation in their risk assessments. They have statistics for their inventory on the rates of observed initiation and they adjust those rates up or down based on factors specific to the dam being evaluated. And from there, they arrive at a probability estimate. I called the International Commission on Large Dams has statistics on dams worldwide, which can be helpful. The Corps of Engineers considers statistical probabilities during risk assessments, but leans more heavily on subjective probability. 
The Corps is a little behind on this, but has been collecting and compiling data on dam and levee incidents, which will be used to calculate a rate of occurrence for different mechanisms. This data, when it is ready, can be considered during a risk assessment. Ideally, we should combine both methods when we can to support robust probability estimates. Incident and failure statistics can be used as a secondary method to check estimated subjective probabilities to make sure they are reasonable and defendable. Be careful though, because statistics are very dependent on the population used for their development, and that population may or may not be similar to the project or conditions that you are evaluating. If they are not similar, it's likely not an appropriate comparison. The bottom line is judgment should always be applied as an overlay to these methods to express our degrees of belief in the adequacy of the data, methods, parameters, and models. Random variables are used to represent an uncertain quantity whose value can take on a number of possible outcomes. It depends on some probability distribution rather than a deterministic rule. This uncertainty can be the result of natural variability or a lack of knowledge. Despite its name, random variables do not necessarily have to describe a random process, which is usually indexed by time, but they can. Let's say you put $1,000 in a bank account with interest compounded annually. The interest rate is a random variable that would be determined the moment you put the money in the bank and it does not change after that. How the amount of money in the bank account changes is a random process that is dependent on the interest rate and the time. Uncertainty is the lack of sureness or confidence in our predictions or conclusions due to imperfect knowledge concerning the present or future state of a system, event, or situation under consideration. Uncertainty with respect to natural phenomena is defined as aleatory uncertainty or natural variability, while uncertainty associated with a belief is defined as epistemic or knowledge uncertainty. The degree of uncertainty often depends on the information available at the time and can range from short of complete shortness to an almost complete lack of conviction about an outcome. Knowledge uncertainty and natural variability were mentioned on the previous slide. Here are the definitions for both terms. Knowledge uncertainty is the result of imperfect knowledge concerning the present or future state of a system under consideration. It leads to a lack of confidence in our predictions. But this type of uncertainty can be reduced by collecting more data or better information. During a risk assessment, teams are to identify sources of knowledge uncertainty as it relates to potential failure modes, and they should show how sensitive the risk estimate is to these uncertainties. Based on this information, recommendations can then be made to reduce uncertainty should the uncertainty have a large impact on the estimate and the ultimate decision. Natural variability is an inherent property of the system or population that is being evaluated. This is something that can be better characterized and addressed quantitatively with more data, but it can never be reduced or eliminated. Session three of this course will discuss uncertainty in more detail. In order to set the stage for the next part of this presentation, when we will get into event trees, it's helpful to consider and discuss set theory and to look at some Venn diagrams. These diagrams will be used to illustrate the probability of and the relationship between events. These simple diagrams can be very helpful when thinking through how potential failure modes are related. Set theory describes the relationships between events and probability theory introduces the concepts of size to the sample space. These events that we are talking about are the basic building blocks of a risk analysis. One way to describe an event is as something that could happen, projected into the present is certain, and this is no matter how likely or unlikely the event may be. For example, we can say an earthquake could occur in September, or we can project into the present and say an earthquake occurs in September. This is gonna be very important when we start building event trees because in an event tree, the events are conditional to or dependent on the occurrence of the prior events in the tree. We'll cover more on that later. Venn diagrams can be very helpful in understanding how different events are related. 
The rectangular box shown here represents the sample space S. All possible outcomes are encompassed by the sample space such that it has a probability of one. In this particular example, there are three different events that can occur, events A, B, and C. Each of these events has a probability between zero and one. Event A might be a concentrated leak erosion failure mode, and event B might be a backward erosion piping failure mode. Breach can occur by either failure mode, or theoretically breach could occur due to both at the same time, which is why you see some overlap between those two circles in the diagram. Event C is mutually exclusive because it cannot occur together with events A or B. Perhaps event C could be failure due to an earthquake without a flood, which is often assumed to be mutually exclusive. We'll cover mutually exclusive events and how best to handle earthquake-driven potential failure modes a little later in this session. The union and intersection of events was briefly introduced on the prior slide. The union of events is calculated by summing the probability of the events minus the probability of their overlap. It is the likelihood that event A or B or both occurs. The total probability of failure that we calculate during a risk assessment is the union of potential failure modes, which can be internal erosion, overtopping, or any other type of failure mode. For the Venn diagram shown here, assuming event A and event B are both potential failure modes, the union of these events is the total probability of failure that can result from these potential failure modes. Breach can occur by failure mode A or by failure mode B, or theoretically by both A and B at the same time. The union equation shown here is for two events and is pretty simple, but it gets more complicated when there are more than two events. While union is synonymous with or, intersection is synonymous with and. It represents the portion where circles for events A and B intersect and overlap. The probability of intersection is the probability of both A and B occurring at the same time. Evaluation of this probability requires some knowledge about the correlation between events A and B. A good example of intersection would be the events that define a failure mode. If you've completed best practices or the fundamentals of internal erosion training, this diagram should look familiar. It comes from Garner and Fannin, and it illustrates how internal erosion initiates when you have the unfavorable coincidence of material accessibility, stress conditions, and critical hydraulic load. Take concentrated leak erosion, for example. A continuous crack must be present and loaded. There must be an unfiltered exit. The material must have enough fines to keep the crack open and the hydraulic and stress conditions in the crack must be high enough for it to occur. Another example of intersecting events would be for an overtopping failure mode. An overtopping failure will require a flood. The flood will have to be high enough for water to get above the crest and enough erosion will have to occur to breach the dam. So the failure probability can be thought of as the intersection of these events. Obviously, the more events you have, the more complicated it gets to account for the intersection, hence the need for De Morgan's rule, which will be discussed later in this course. The diagram here shows four intersecting events, and I think you can imagine how much more complicated the diagram would become as you add events. Two events are said to be complementary events when one event occurs if and only if the other does not. For example, a levee breaches or it does not. A dam overtops or it does not. They are complements. You will see this when we discuss the branches of an event tree. In one part of the branch, an event occurs, and in the complementary event tree branch, the event does not occur and is equal to one minus the probability of the event occurring. Said another way, when events are complementary, the sum of their probabilities will be equal to one. Conditional probability is the probability of one event occurring with some relationship to one or more other events. Conditional probabilities are something that we deal with quite often when working with event trees and pathways through those trees. The nomenclature for conditional events is a vertical line, which is sometimes called a pipe, that separates the variable and can be read as either given that or conditional on. 
So the term in the first bullet would be read as the probability of B given that A occurs because B is conditional on A. If A and B have a conditional relationship, then observing that A occurs gives you additional information about the probability that B also occurred and vice versa. Intersection is when two events happen at the same time. Conditional is when knowing that one event occurs gives you information about the probability of occurrence of a separate event. An example might be the probability of you going for a walk outside today, which for most people would be conditional on the weather and its forecast. The higher the probability of rain, the lower probability of you going outside for a walk. Independent events are events that have no relationship between their probability and observing one event tells you nothing about the probability of another event occurring. Potential failure modes are typically developed and elicited assuming independence. Assuming independence between potential failure modes, though, is not always guaranteed to be a good assumption. For example, if you have a dam with a gated structure, failure or inoperability of the gates would impact the reservoir stage. As a result, the risk associated with an internal erosion failure mode would be dependent on the operability of gates because the internal erosion potential failure mode would be dependent on the reservoir stage. Another example where independence would not be a good assumption would be for a dam that has two separate embankments that would overstop at the same time, but where one is much more erodible than the other. If the more erodible embankment breaches first, the overtopping hydrograph for the other embankment changes. So the probability of the less erodible embankment breaching would be dependent on if and when the more erodible embankment were to breach. Mutually exclusive events are events that cannot occur together. In a Venn diagram, the circles for mutually exclusive events will have no intersection. An example would be a set of Tanner gates where event A is exactly one gate failing to open and event B is exactly two gates failing to open. These events cannot both happen at the same time. I discussed mutually exclusive events briefly a few slides earlier and mentioned that it is a common assumption to assume flood and earthquake failure modes to be mutually exclusive. In reality, flood and earthquake failure modes are not mutually exclusive as there is some small overlap between them, but the probability associated with that overlap is almost always negligible. If events are said to be collectively exhaustive, this means that the events jointly comprise all possible outcomes. In the diagram, we have sample space S, which is the area inside the rectangle, and we have events A and B. Because events A and B take up the entire area of the sample space, the sum of their probabilities is equal to one, and the events are collectively exhaustive. When we get into event trees, event tree branches from a node are both mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. Now that we have defined mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, let's apply them to each of the next four examples to make sure we understand the terms and the concepts. For example one, we have two events, A and B, that intersect and only fill part of the sample space. Would these events be considered mutually exclusive? How about collectively exhaustive? Because they intersect, they cannot be mutually exclusive. And because the events do not encompass all possible outcomes, they are not collectively exhaustive. For example, two, we have two events, A and B, that do not intersect and only fill part of the sample space. Because they do not intersect, they are mutually exclusive. And because the events do not encompass all possible outcomes, they are not collectively exhaustive. How about for the next example? Mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, or both? The answer is both. Events A and B do not intersect, and they fill the entire sample space, encompassing all possible outcomes.
Here we have our fourth and final example, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, or both. Like the previous example, events A and B encompass all possible outcomes, so they would be collectively exhaustive. But because there is an intersection, the events are not mutually exclusive. Next, let's move into total probability theorem. In the diagram, the rectangle is a sample space representing the entire range of flood loading possible, both above and below the threshold for failure. The events shaded in blue, B1 through B6, which are mutually exclusive, represent the probability of the loading being within a specific interval or range, and the red area is the probability of failure. Notice that failure overlaps to different degrees with each of the different loading ranges defined by the blue areas. The total probability theorem states that the probability of A will be equal to the probability of A given that B interval occurs multiplied by the probability of that B interval and then summed up over all intervals. This is what we do when we work through an event tree to calculate the annual probability of failure. Probability of a given load is multiplied by the probability of failure given that load, which are then summed for all loading conditions. The example on the next slide should help illustrate this concept. Consider an embankment dam with a continuous transverse crack. The crack extends down to a certain depth. Failure as a result of this crack through concentrated leak erosion can only occur if the reservoir stage gets above the bottom of the crack. We can take the range of stages that exceed the base of the crack, the only ones that can result in failure, and divide them into a set of intervals as shown here. Here is a better look at those stage intervals. Going back to the diagram we used to introduce the total probability theorem, the sample space is the full range of flood loading, even those that do not get above the base of the crack. The probability of the reservoir reaching a stage that is within one of the six loading intervals above the crack, B1 through B6, is represented by the blue area in the figure. The red area is the probability of failure and it can be calculated by first multiplying the probability of A given a stage at interval B, known as the system response, by the loading probability of the interval. This is done for each interval, then the products of all the intervals are summed together. The equations are shown at the bottom of the slide. To summarize at each interval, we are multiplying the loading probability by the conditional failure probability or system response then summing up these products to get the total probability of failure. Consider this an introduction to what we will cover more in depth in session two of this course. If it does not make perfect sense now, it will hopefully start clicking and become clear when we start working through the next session. Next, we will cover one last topic before doing an exercise and diving into event trees. The topic is binomial theorem and Pascal's triangle. Binomial theorem and Pascal's triangle were both covered in best practices, but we're covering them again here because of their applicability to risk assessments on projects with gated structures and the reliability of those gates. When we have statistically independent events for which the order of outcomes does not matter, binomial theorem can be used to calculate the probability of the different potential outcomes. The relationship shown here is helpful when we have assessed the probability of failure of an individual gate, either through structural analysis or a fault tree analysis, that we can then assume to be consistent for each of the spillway gates because they were all constructed the same way and at the same time. Once we have the probability of failure for a single gate, we need to apply that to calculate the probability of failure for a series of gates, where more than one gate can fail. Depending on the number of gates, there will be a variety of scenarios to evaluate, such as exactly one gate failing, exactly two gates failing, and so on and so forth. To do this, we will use the equation on the slide. The variable P would be for the gate failure probability, N would be the total number of gates, and K would be the number of gates that we assume to fail for a given scenario.
To solve this equation, and to make the math a little easier, we can get the result of the first term using Pascal's triangle instead of computing a bunch of factorials. In the triangle, each row corresponds to a specific n, starting with n equals zero. Within the row, each box corresponds to the value k, starting with k equals zero at the far left, and moving up one for every box you move to the right. Count over to the value of k, and the number in the box will be the first term in the equation. So stepping through an example should help make this clear. Let's say we have four spillway gates, each with a 0.1 probability of not opening. To calculate the probability of exactly two gates not opening, we can use Pascal's triangle. Because we have four gates, n equals four. Because we want to know the probability of exactly two gates not opening, k equals two. So we find the row for n equals four, then across the row to k equals two, not forgetting that the first row is for n equals zero and the first column is for k equals zero. And then we get the value of six for our first term. We plug our values into the equation using a probability of 0.1 for p, and we get a probability of 0 0.0486 for the probability of exactly two gates not opening. If you do not want to use Pascal's triangle, Microsoft Excel has a nice function built in that will do the calculation for you called binome dist. The first input is k, the second is n, and the third is p. The last input will either be true or false. To select a cumulative distribution to get the probability of k or fewer gates not opening, input true. To get the probability of exactly k gates not opening, input false. So redoing the example from the previous slide where k equaled 2, n equaled 4, and p equaled 0.1, we choose false because the question asked for the probability of exactly two gates not opening. And as shown in the red box, you can see we get a probability of 0 0.0486, which is the same as we calculated earlier using Pascal's triangle. When we have gates, we must consider all the different inoperability conditions because each scenario impacts the stage frequency differently. If we are looking at gate failures, the incremental consequences will be different for each scenario and will increase for the scenarios where more gates fail. These calculated probabilities become an important part to a complete and defendable risk estimate. This brings us to our first exercise, exercise 1.1, binomial distribution. Please open up the module one exercise and homework file from the course material now. This file will have separate tabs for the three exercises that we will do during this module. The exercise asks, given eight spillway gates, each with a probability of 0 0.05 of not opening, what is the probability of five gates not opening? And what is the probability of at least three gates not opening? If you decide to complete the exercise using Microsoft Excel, I've included the formula on the slide. Please pause the video and work through the exercise. When you're finished, press play for the solution. Here is the solution. We have eight spillway gates, so n equals eight. And for the first question, we wanna know the probability of exactly five gates not opening, so k equals five. P is equal to 0 0.05, so we can plug it into the equation I provided. K is the first term, N is the second term, P is the third term, and we type in false for the last term, since we do not want a cumulative probability. We want the probability of exactly five gates not opening. This returns a probability of 1.5 times 10 to the minus five. For the second question, we need to be careful and use a little critical thinking because the question asks for the probability of at least three gates not opening. To do this, we can calculate the probability of two or less gates not opening. Then by subtracting the probability of two or less not opening from one, we can get the probability of three or more gates not opening. So we have one minus our binomial distribution function with k equals two, n is still equal to eight, 
and P is still equal to 0 0.05. This time we want to choose true so the formula will return a cumulative probability, the probability of two or less not opening. From this equation, we get the answer to be 5.79 times 10 to the minus three. Another way to answer the second question is to calculate the probability of exactly three gates not opening and exactly four gates not opening and exactly five, exactly six, exactly seven, and on up to exactly eight gates not opening, and then sum those probabilities. You'll see that we'll get the same result, a probability of 5.79 times 10 to the minus three. From this table, you can also see how the probability is drastically lower when more and more gates are assumed not to open. Practically, when doing a risk assessment, you can use these results to prune branches from the event tree, such as the seven and eight gate failure scenarios, because of the remote probabilities. The probabilities for the seven and eight gate failure scenarios are so low that they will have a negligible contribution to the total project risk. To make things a bit easier, the RMC's event combination toolbox can be used to assess the probability of K or more gates failing or exactly K gates failing. Here's the solution to the previous exercise using the identical probabilities worksheet from the toolbox, since each gate has the same probability of not opening. Simply input the probability of a single gate failure P and the total number of gates N in the yellow boxes, and the spreadsheet will do the rest. In the previous example, each gate had the same probability of failure. However, if each gate has a unique probability of failure, it gets more complicated. Each scenario must be accounted for. The unique gates worksheet in the RMC's event combination toolbox can be used to assess up to six gates, each with a different or unique probability of failure. Failure probabilities are highlighted in red, and the unhighlighted values are probabilities of not failing, one minus the failure probabilities. In this example, there are five gates, and each gate has the unique probability of failure shown in the top row. To obtain the probability of one gate failing, the calculations are shown. The probability of only gate one failing is obtained by multiplying the probability of gate one failing by the probability of each of the other gates not failing. The process is repeated for each of the other five gates, and the results are summed. The solution from the toolbox is shown in the summary table at the bottom right. I've mentioned event trees several times up to this point, and we are now ready to discuss them. While a variety of methods are available for analyzing engineering risks, event trees have become commonplace for dam and levee safety studies because through event trees, you can take a complex process like a dam or levee breach and deconstruct it into a series of events or steps that are easier to specifically define and to evaluate. This helps us with analysis and understanding the risk. It also helps us in communicating the risk and aids the decision-making process by making the key factors more evident. Like all other tools, event trees are imperfect and their potential value depends on the skills of the user. So hopefully we will all be skilled in developing and understanding event trees at the end of this session. First, some definitions. An event tree is a sequence of random variables or event sets that can be associated with random variables. It is a graphical depiction of the sequence of events leading to a particular set of outcomes, which in our case is typically breach or non-breach, which have associated life loss and economic consequences. A chance node is a branching point at which a new variable is introduced in the tree, and a branch probability is the probability of the event given the occurrence of those events that preceded in the tree. I will step through an example of an event tree on the next slide. Here is an example of an event tree. Each branching point of the event tree is referred to as a chance node. Branches and their associated branch probabilities emanate from each of the chance nodes. In the last node at the rightmost side of the event tree are end nodes, which are aptly named because that's where the tree ends. 
An event tree pathway goes from node to node along the branches until you reach an end node or outcome. Generally, as discussed previously, we're going to use separate trees for each initiating event type, flood and earthquake. For simplicity, even though they are not, we will almost always assume them to be mutually exclusive. This way we can keep them separate and can simply add the probabilities to get the total failure probability. Although flood and earthquakes are not mutually exclusive, the odds of having an earthquake at the same time as a large flood event are low and typically negligible. Branches and event trees can represent a variety of things. It can be the system response of a dam or levee system to event sequences, human actions and interventions, emergency response and factors affecting survival during flooding, or continuously operating or standby systems. Starting first with the basics of event trees. Each branch represents an event or state of nature. Each pathway of an event tree is unique. An event sequence must be logical, but not necessarily chronological. Branches must be mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. Remember that mutually exclusive events cannot occur together, and the probability of collectively exhaustive events will sum to one. Event tree branches are conditional on all prior pathway events. These are the events that are to the left in the tree, as shown on the next slide. Here, the probability of D is conditional to the occurrence of events A, B, and C. Next, we have some rules. Event tree rule number one is pretty basic. All probabilities must be greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one. Event tree rule number two. The sum of the probabilities originating from a single chance node must be equal to one. Here, the sum of the probabilities from these three branches must sum to one. And each set of branches emanating from each of these three chance nodes must also equal one. Events must be mutually exclusive so they can be summed, and because they must sum to one, they must also be collectively exhaustive. Event tree rule number three. The probabilities for each branch must be conditional on all preceding branches. In this example, we start with the probability of reaching a given stage, then the probability of hydraulic fracture given the stage, followed by the probability of initiation given the stage and that hydraulic fracture has occurred. So the branch probabilities are evaluated conditional on all preceding branches being true. This is a very important rule to follow, else the total probability for a given event tree pathway will be underestimated. Event tree rule number four, the probabilities for a branch can be a function of any state variable in the preceding branches. In this example, failure is a function of both stage and discharge. Perhaps we are looking at a dam conduit where the outflow is large enough to overtop the training walls, and that leads to erosion and slope instability. Then the only way for slope instability to result in a breach is for the pool to be up and the slide to be large enough to lower the dam crest below the pool. So failure in that instance would be a function of both stage and discharge. Finally, some calculations. Probabilities along pathways are multiplied and probabilities across branches are summed. In this example, to get the probability of cracking, there are two pathways that result in cracking. In the event tree, we start with an earthquake and the foundation either liquefies or it does not. If the foundation does not liquefy, there can still be enough movement to crack the embankment. If the foundation does liquefy, the probability of embankment cracking is even greater because of the increased differential settlement. The sum of these two end probabilities will then give the total probability of cracking. Event tree analysis steps. Regardless of what software package you use to complete your calculations, whether that be RMC QRA calcs, RMC total risk, Palisades Precision Tree or Damray, these steps will hold true.
with the exception of precision tree, which can be cumbersome to be used for big projects. It can be difficult to see how the event tree math is being completed, so you need to know where things are going and how the inputs are being used. We will discuss this more in future sessions of the course. Regarding the steps, you will first want to make sure all your input data is organized. Figure out your risk driving failure modes, how you are going to evaluate them, and the loading variables for which they are dependent. These loading variables can be inflow, stage, overtopping depth, PGA, or something else. Determine your consequence types and your consequence centers and the significant exposure factors. I'll talk about exposure a little more later. Determine your breach scenarios to estimate your consequences. Then when you go to create your event trees or trees depending on your project, start with the loading variables and any factors that affect them like gate reliability or debris blockage. From that loading, proceed to the potential failure modes, which each will have their own sub-event tree, then on to exposure factors and consequences. Once you have your tree mapped out, input the estimated loading probability relationships, your system response probability relationships, state functions, exposure factors, and consequences. Be sure to have someone double check your inputs because there's a lot going on, and it's easy to type a value in wrong or to paste something into the wrong place. In the end, when you have completed the calculations and get some results, be sure to do a gut check to make sure the results look reasonable and make sense with your inputs. It's also good practice to perform a sensitivity on all key inputs to help you understand and ultimately communicate what is driving the risk and why, and how those risks could change if your uncertain inputs change. This figure shows the general framework for building a project of entry. Again, the loading feeds into the system response, which then leads into the associated consequences. You can also use sub-event trees for any step along the way. Let's walk through an example of entry starting with level one and the continuous hazard function. Levels are added at the top of the tree for reference purposes. The first level in the example project event tree represents a continuous function. Continuous functions are denoted by a fan symbol and represent continuous random variables that can take on an infinite number of values over a specified range. In practice, we represent continuous functions using a series of branches like the one shown in the box to the right. How many branches you need will depend on the project conditions, the potential failure modes you are evaluating, and how precise an estimate you need. In this example, each branch represents a range of reservoir elevations, and each is assigned a corresponding probability. Together, these branches are both mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, and they cover the entire range of the flood hazard. Continuous functions are most often used to represent hazard variables, such as peak flood stage, stage duration, spillway inflow or outflow, or earthquake ground accelerations. Here is an example of a continuous loading branch for a stage frequency curve. In this example, the stage frequency curve defines the hydrologic hazard and is split into eight different intervals. As shown, these intervals do not have to be even, but they must encompass the entire range of loading. In level two is a discrete function. Discrete functions are used to represent discrete random variables that can take on only a finite number of values, with each value being represented by a separate branch. The number of branches is selected to match the number of discrete values that the variable can take on, with each discrete branch being assigned a probability of occurrence. In this example, the discrete random variable is tanner gate inoperability for a spillway containing two tanner gates. As such, three discrete function branches are required, with the branches representing zero gates inoperable, one gate inoperable, and two gates inoperable. As with the continuous function, the probabilities of the discrete function branches emanating from a single discrete variable must sum to one, making them mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. When there is a gated spillway, as shown in the example, the discrete probabilities will typically be informed by a fault tree analysis and the RMC's event combination toolbox. 
Fault trees, as will be discussed in the next few slides, can be used to calculate the probability of inoperability for each gate, and the event combination spreadsheet can be used to calculate the discrete probability for each gate inoperability scenario. A fault tree is a graphical construct that shows the logical interaction among the elements of a system whose failure, individually or in combination, could contribute to the occurrence of a defined undesired event, such as a system failure. A fault tree starts not with events possibly contributing to failure, but with the failure state itself, and it asks what might need to happen for that failure state to occur. As such, it is a top-down deductive failure analysis in which an undesired state of a system is analyzed using Boolean logic to combine a series of lower level events. This slide illustrates the basic fault tree structure. The top event defines the system failure. Logic gates describe the relationships between sub-events. Sub-events include intermediate on down to basic events. The primary use of fault trees in dam safety are with mechanical and electrical systems. Because a dam is not easily broken down into a fully enumerated set of components, and because it is not easy to link failures among a subset of those components to subsequent failures of others, fault tree analysis is difficult to apply in practical dam safety studies, and event tree analysis is the common approach. Fault tree analysis uses Boolean logic, which is a branch of algebra in which all operations are either true or false, yes or no and all relationships between the operations can be expressed with logical operators such as AND, OR, or NOT. For the AND operator, all conditions must be present for the operation to be true. For the OR operator, the operation is true if any of the conditions are present. It is inclusive. Lastly, for the NOT operator, the operation is true if a specific condition is present, but the others are not. For example, in this simple fault tree, we have one AND gate. We are asked to calculate the probability that both the emergency and commercial power backups fail. Because we have an AND gate, for there to be a power system failure, both the commercial power backup and emergency power backup must fail. We can look at this top event as a Venn diagram. For the intersection of the independent events, the probability of interest is the intersection of the two event circles. Therefore, to obtain the intersection of the events, the individual event probabilities are simply multiplied as shown. In this second example, we are asked to calculate the probability of a gate failing to operate on demand given the three events or faults shown. Failure of the gate operation controls, the gate mechanical drive, or the electrical power source. Here we have an OR gate. For a gate to fail to operate on demand, any one of the events or faults listed must occur. We can again look at the top event as a Venn diagram. For the union of independent events, the probability of interest is the area bounded by the perimeter of the three event circles. The intersection of the events must be subtracted from the sum of the areas to avoid double counting. After subtracting the individual pairs of intersecting events, the intersection of all three events must then be added back in. A simpler way to get the same result would be to take one minus the probability none of the three events occurs. This is known as De Morgan's rule, which I will cover in more detail a bit later. Before getting back into event trees, let's take a look at a couple more examples of fault trees. Here is a relatively simple fault tree for a wire rope drive system. It was created using isographs for liability workbench used by the Corps of Engineers. The system fails if any of the components fail, as indicated by the use of an OR gate. Events are numbered for tracking. Q corresponds to the probability of unreliability or unavailability, presumably because it's next to R in the alphabet, and R is commonly used to represent reliability or availability. Thus, Q equals 1 minus R. Eta, the characteristic life, and tau, the inspection or operation interval, are variable used in the dormant Weibel formula. Failures remain dormant or hidden until the system is needed, 
or until failures are discovered during scheduled inspections. Characteristic life is traditionally gathered through testing of thousands of samples in a controlled laboratory environment. The Corps of Engineers has performed an extensive data collection of its mechanical and electrical equipment on flood risk management projects throughout the U.S. Results from this field data collection were sent to the University of Maryland Reliability Analysis Center to determine the characteristic life and beta shape parameters using Bayesian Weibull analysis. See Chapter G4 in the Best Practices Manual for more details on input variables to the dormant Weibull formula. Here is an example of a fault tree for a flood control gate. There are many components comprising the mechanical and electrical system. Often, if one of the components fail, then the entire system fails. Teams should sift through the various components to determine which ones are driving the system failure. Now back to event trees. In levels three, four, and five, we have transform functions. As their name implies, transform functions are used to transform values of one variable to another variable without a chance node. We can use set relationships that can help us transition from one variable to another, like inflow to outflow, or inflow to peak stage, or peak stage to overtopping depth. Performance and associated consequences can be functions of different loading variables than what was used to define the initial hazard function. Much of the time, they are a function of stage, but they can be a function of a lot of other things too, like overtopping depth or outflow. So being able to use a function to move from one variable to the next is very useful. In this example, overtopping depth in level four is a function of peak stage and is equal to that peak stage minus the embankment crest elevation. Now event tree diagrams can become very large. While the risk calculations for the entire event tree need to be completed to arrive at the final risk estimate, the portrayal of the event tree can be condensed to the use of collapsed nodes, which are indicated in the tree by plus signs. When a plus sign appears in the tree, it signifies that the structure of the event tree will be identical to that of the branch above it. In the example, the one gate inoperable and two gates inoperable contain plus signs. Therefore, the structure of the tree after those nodes is identical to the zero gate inoperable branch. Each gate scenario, however, results in a different peak spillway discharge, peak stage, peak overtopping depth, and overtopping duration, which are obtained using the transform functions. On this slide is a more detailed illustration of how a transform function works. Here, the continuous function is a function of pool, and the system response is a function of overtopping depth, which do not match. Because they do not match, we need a state function to relate pool to overtopping depth. The state function in this case will be the pool minus the top of dam elevation. This of course gives us the overtopping depth. So now we have a relationship that transforms the continuous loading relationship to one with the same variable as our system response. We now know the probability of each specific depth of overtopping, and we have the system response as a function of overtopping. So we can then multiply those across each loading range and then sum them to get the probability of failure. In the next level of the event tree is the system response functions. This is where we will input the estimated system response probabilities, which are the probability of failure given the loading. Like I said before, the system response can be a function of a variety of things like stage, PGA, earthquake magnitude, etc. Each set of system response functions will have a corresponding function for non-breach. This is the case because each set of branches from a given node must be collectively exhaustive so that we satisfy event tree rule number two. Failure branch probabilities are often calculated using sub-event trees. You can do the calculations in one large event tree without using sub-event trees if you want, but the trees will get quite large and can be very difficult to manage. Using sub-event trees will help you to organize and manage the overall project event tree. Here's an example of a basic internal erosion event tree, which most have probably seen. It moves through flaw, initiation, continuation, progression, unsuccessful intervention, and breach.
Here is another example of a sub-event tree that splits seismic crest deformation and overtopping by whether or not foundation liquefaction occurs. You can also have a sub-event tree within a sub-event tree, like for intervention. Remember, we had unsuccessful intervention back on the internal erosion sub-event tree. Exposure functions are the fraction of time that a portion of the population at risk is exposed to dam or levee failure in a particular way. At a minimum, we consider time of day since most people are usually in different places during the day than they are at night. At night, they are usually at home, whereas during the day, they are typically at work. Other examples might be weekdays versus weekends. Time of year can sometimes also be important, like if there is a popular camping area that will have more people there in the summer, or if there's a ski resort that has more people there in the wintertime. How many exposure branches you need to account for is going to depend on how the population at risk changes at different times, days, or seasons. Lastly, we have the consequence functions, breach and non-breach life loss, and economic cost. Just like system response probabilities, incremental and non-breach consequences can be a function of peak stage or discharge. To get the consequences associated with dam or levee failure, you will need to use the incremental consequences, which is the total breach consequences minus the non-breach. We'll talk more about incremental risk in the next module. Combining and adjusting event probabilities. Risk estimates must be combined in a way that is technically correct so that the collective impact of all the potential failure modes can be expressed in a credible manner. We need to be careful not to incorrectly inflate the total risk by how we combine these failure modes to get a total. When breach characteristics and consequences are different, we need to be very careful not to distort the estimated risk by how we combine them. If you can think back to a few slides ago, we discussed how branches must be mutually exclusive. Failure modes are often not mutually exclusive. So how do we deal with where failure modes overlap or intersect? There are three options that we can use to deal with this issue. The first option is to simply ignore the intersection events and assume failure modes are mutually exclusive. If we do this, we will overestimate the result by some amount. But that's fine so long as the intersection probability is small and the consequences are not significantly different for the intersecting event. Option two is we can ignore the intersection events but distribute the probability. In doing so, you will get the correct total probability of failure but the risk will not be quite right because you have not considered the potential for increased consequences that may result from the intersecting event. This is an acceptable approach so long as the consequences are not significantly different for the intersecting event, which is typically the case. The third and final option is to just go for it and to enumerate the intersection event. You will get the same probability of failure as you would from option two, but will have a more precise representation of the risk because you are explicitly considering all the possible breach combinations. This slide gives a visual of the three methods that I just discussed, where we can ignore, distribute, or enumerate the intersection. Each of these methods provides ways to go from statistically independent failure modes to mutually exclusive failure modes, but none are without limitations or drawbacks. In the bottom left of the figure, you can clearly see how ignoring the intersection overestimates the risk because the intersection probability is double counted. In the other two methods, you can see how the area is the same for both and that we'll get the same total probability of failure. The issue with distributing the intersection is we do not consider the consequences of the intersection, but evaluating that extra scenario can be a lot of work for a scenario that has little contribution to the total risk. So the vast majority of the time, we will simply distribute the intersection. To calculate the union or intersection between multiple events, we can use De Morgan's rule. We know that the probability of independent events not occurring is equal to the product of their complements, 
the probability of event A and event B not occurring is equal to the product of one minus the probability of A and one minus the probability of B. Now that I have the probability of neither event occurring, I can take one minus that product to get the probability of either event A or event B occurring. This is the union of events A and B. So the probability that both independent events occur is equal to one minus the product of their complements. The next slide will give a good illustration of this process. By De Morgan's rule, we calculate the union's complement, the probability of neither event occurring, then subtract that probability from one to get the probability of union. Please note that De Morgan's rule assumes that each of the failure modes are independent. So what if the failure modes are not independent? This is where we can consider the unimodal bounds theorem to bound the problem. The theorem states that the total probability of failure is somewhere between the highest single failure mode probability and the total probability of failure of the system calculated using De Morgan's rule. If the total probability is equal to the probability of the highest single failure mode, then the potential failure modes are perfectly correlated. If the total probability is equal to the probability calculated by De Morgan's rule, then the failure modes are perfectly uncorrelated or independent. The true solution will be somewhere in between these values. When one failure mode has a dominant probability, one that is much higher than the other failure modes, the difference between the unimodal bounds will be quite small, which I will illustrate next with an example. In this example, we are given three system response probabilities from three different overtopping failure modes. The unimodal bounds theorem states the total probability will be somewhere in between the highest individual failure mode probability, which will be the overtopping of the saddle dam, P3, and one minus the products of the events complements or De Morgan's rule. So we take one minus P1, one minus P2, and one minus P3, multiply them together and subtract that product from one to calculate the upper bound of the total failure probability. From this example, you can see that the probability will be somewhere between 0.5 and 0.55. The difference is small because P3 is so much larger than the other potential failure modes. But if those probabilities had all been similar, the spread between the bounds would increase. While we do not often use unimodal bounds theorem explicitly, we give a nod to it by how we plot failure modes on the FN chart for those who are familiar with it. We plot the total, which typically includes a common cause adjustment, but we plot each individual failure mode without adjustment. So by definition, the actual probability of failure falls between those two points, the total we calculate with the adjustment and the highest potential failure mode. Next, let's discuss the risk models available for combining and adjusting event probabilities. Here is a quick overview of the five models that will be covered. There is the marginal risk model, the exclusive risk model, the joint risk model, common cause adjustment, and the competing risk model. Of the risk models, the common cause adjustment has been the most prominent for past quantitative risk assessments. The first method is the marginal risk method, which considers only marginal probabilities. A marginal probability describes the probability of an event irrespective of the occurrence of other events. So for a set of potential failure modes, a total is not calculated when using the marginal risk model. We use this method to identify actionable potential failure modes because the risk associated with the potential failure mode can be reduced by the presence of other potential failure modes. While this model is simple and flexible, it is not typically representative of actual risk because the actual risk will typically be the result of multiple failure modes. The exclusive risk model ignores the intersection of potential failure modes and assumes the failure modes are mutually exclusive. To calculate the total using this model, the marginal probabilities are summed. Again, a marginal probability describes the probability of an event irrespective of the occurrence of other events. 
The exclusive risk model is appropriate when the dependence among potential failure modes is negligible with respect to both probability and consequences. This method is often used to simplify risk calculations when completing a screening. The joint risk model enumerates all possible combinations, which are then summed together to calculate the total probability. This is necessary when joint failure can influence the risk estimate, such as for a long levy where multiple breaches can occur during the same flood event. While this model will produce the most accurate result, it can be very cumbersome when there are more than a couple failure modes. Assumptions can be made to simplify the effort, but the consequences for each of the joint failure events must be evaluated. For example, when there are three potential failure modes, seven unique failure events must be evaluated. How to calculate the probability of each of these events is shown to the right. These probabilities can then be summed to get the total probability, the same total probability that would be calculated using De Morgan's rule. The next risk model is the common cause adjustment. This method distributes the intersection to avoid overestimation of the total probability. The intersection is weighted and distributed by potential failure mode, as shown by the equation on the screen, with the largest failure mode getting the largest portion of the intersection, and the smallest potential failure mode getting the smallest portion. First, the total probability is calculated using De Morgan's rule. That probability is multiplied by the probability of the given failure mode and then divided by the sum of all potential failure modes. So what kind of failure mode should we consider a common cause adjustment? We would consider common cause adjustment for failure modes that can occur simultaneously at a single section due to a single initiating event, such as concentrated leak erosion along a conduit and backward erosion piping beneath the same conduit. We would also consider an adjustment for the potential failure modes that can occur simultaneously in multiple sections due to a single initiating event. In these instances, the total probability of failure is some combination of the probabilities of failure that are associated with each of the possible modes. This adjustment should be made simultaneously over all sections of a multi-section dam in all common cause failure modes for all sections. It should be calculated and applied separately in each probability interval for loading type. Now let's take a look at how to perform a common cause adjustment at a given stage. We are given probabilities for three potential failure modes, P1, P2, and P3. For P1, which has a probability of 0.65, we are going to take that 0.65 probability and multiply it by the De Morgan's rule equation, which is equal to one minus the product of all the failure mode probability complements. Then we are going to divide by the sum of all the failure mode probabilities. This reduces the probability from 0.65 to 0.445. When you make an adjustment, the adjusted probability will always decrease. It will never increase. We then repeat that process for the other two failure modes. In this example, if I had ignored the intersection and simply summed the probabilities, I would get a probability greater than one, which violates the rules because all probabilities must be greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one. When I perform De Morgan's rule and distribute the intersection, I now get the correct probability and a probability that is less than one. Here we have one more example covering common cause adjustment, after which I'll ask you to try an exercise on your own. We start with the marginal system response probabilities in the first table. In the second table, we will take the complement of each probability as an intermediate step to help us in the next step when we apply De Morgan's rule. This step is not really part of De Morgan's rule, but will make life easier when using Microsoft Excel because we'll be set up to use a product function, which I'll show you shortly. The adjusted probabilities are shown in the final table. 
For failure mode D at a stage of elevation 475, I'll take one minus the product of all the complements, which are the values in the green box. I'll divide that by the sum of all the marginal probabilities in the red box, and then multiply by the individual marginal probability, which is in the blue box. The result will be the adjusted value in the gold box. When one failure mode has a dominant probability, or when all the probabilities are relatively small, the common cause adjustment will usually be small. We then repeat the process for every stage for every failure mode. To get the adjusted probability for PFNB at a stage of elevation 525, the rows and values we use for the calculation will shift downward, but the procedure is exactly the same. It will now be your turn to do a common cause adjustment. In the table, you have three different potential failure modes and space to complete the intermediate step I showed you, which should make it easier to perform De Morgan's rule and to calculate the adjusted system response probabilities. Before you start, I have a quick Microsoft Excel tip that may help you do the calculations a little more quickly. If you use dollar signs to lock column positions, row positions, or both, you can then drag the formulas without those cell references changing. If you do not lock any of the cells, all cells will move over and down with how far you drag the formula. For the exercise, if you lock the column position when doing the De Morgan's rule portion in the numerator, and again for the probability sum in the denominator, you will be able to type out the adjusted system response probability formula only once and then drag it over and down. To drag, click on the cell and move your cursor over to the green square in the bottom right corner. The mouse point will change to a plus sign. You can then click and drag the formula horizontally across columns or vertically down rows. Again, for the exercise, you will want to lock the columns for the cells that define the red box portion of the equation. Please pause the video now and work through the exercise. When you are finished, press play to continue. Okay, let's work out this exercise. We are given the marginal system response probabilities for three potential failure modes, and we are asked to perform a common cause adjustment. First, we will perform an intermediate step and calculate the complement for each marginal probability by taking one minus the probability. So we take one minus cell C8. We can then click in the corner of the cell and drag the formula over and down to use the same formula, but reference different cells. This completes the intermediate step and fills the middle portion of the table. The complement of the system response probabilities are shown here. Next, we are going to use the common cause adjustment formula to calculate the adjusted system response. We take the first system response probability, the one for PFM1 at pool 728.4. We multiply it by one minus the product of the complements for all other potential failure modes at that pool, and then divide by the sum of all the potential failure mode marginal system response probabilities. You can see how much simpler the formula becomes once we have performed the intermediate step of calculating the complements. You can then use the product formula for the numerator. If you opted not to use the product or sum functions, the formula would be what you see in the bottom right. Now that we have that formula input, we need to add dollar signs to lock some of the columns so that we can drag the formula to the other cells instead of retyping it each time. We will lock the columns in the product and sum portions within the red box of the formula. The dollar sign goes in front of the letter designation of the cell. Do not lock the columns or rows of that first cell reference in the formula that is left of the red box.
Again, if you did not use the product or sum functions, you're still good, and the formula with the dollar signs in the appropriate place will be what you see in the bottom right. Now, with that complete, we can click the square in the corner of the cell, drag the formula over, then down to finish out the rest of the table. Here's the solution for the exercise. For anyone who had trouble, I have provided the Excel formulas at the top, and I've provided the equations in numerical form to help you think through it. Please note that many of the concepts of this course will build from one session to the next, so if you did not complete the exercise correctly, please go back and give it another shot. Then if you're still having trouble, please reach out to one of the course instructors and we can help you through it. When done correctly, summing the potential failure modes probabilities at each given stage will give you the following values which are equal to the value that would be obtained using De Morgan's rule. Comparing the plots of the marginal system response to the common cause adjusted system response, you can see that the probabilities for all three failure modes have been reduced. You can also see that had we summed the marginal probabilities for the three failure modes at pool elevation 770.8, we would have gotten a total probability greater than one. The common cause adjustment solves this problem, with the total becoming 0.935 after adjustment. The final risk model covered in this module is the competing risk model, which is analogous to a weakest link approach. The model assumes joint failures cannot occur, such that the first failure precludes additional failures and or additional consequences. As such, the total risk is calculated for each potential failure mode, assuming failure does not occur by any of the other modes because there is no intersection of events. One example where the competing risk model is appropriate is a levy breaching prior to overtopping and filling the levied area, thereby preventing another breach and additional consequences from occurring when the levy later overtops. Another would be a dam breach that quickly empties the reservoir, thereby preventing breach by any other potential failure mode. In the competing risk model, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the set of potential failure modes and the set of possible failure events. For example, a system with three potential failure modes, A, B, and C, there are three mutually exclusive failure events, A, but not B or C, B, but not A or C, and C, but not A or B. The response for each potential failure mode is calculated assuming the survival of the remaining potential failure modes up to a specified hazard. The adjusted system response A from the competing risk model is equal to the integral of the system response for A multiplied by the survival function for the remaining failure modes with respect to the hazard. The survival function will be the product of the system response complements of the other failure modes. In this example, for A, but not B or C, the survival function will be 1 minus the system response of failure mode B multiplied by 1 minus the system response for failure mode C. So, in the competing risk model, the probability for A becomes the integral of the system response for A multiplied by the probability B does not occur multiplied by the probability C does not occur. The probability for B becomes the integral of the system response for B multiplied by the probability A does not occur multiplied by the probability C does not occur. And the probability of C becomes the integral of the system response for C multiplied by the probability of A not occurring multiplied by the probability that B does not occur. An integral of a function is equal to a numerical value equal to the area under the graph of that function. In the case of failure mode A within the competing risk model, the function is the system response of A multiplied by the survival function of the other failure modes, one minus the system response probability of B times one minus the system response probability of C. We can get the solution for the integral by plotting the system response for A against the survival function of the other failure modes and calculating the area beneath the curve. Please note that the system response and the survival function are all a function of the hazard cube. 
the system response for all failure modes will be taken to be zero for hazard Q0. This means at Q0, the system response for A will be equal to zero, and the survival function will be equal to one at Q0. So for hazard Q1, we are going to integrate from Q0 to Q1. The system response for A, assuming competing risk, will be equal to the area shown in red. The area can be calculated by taking the change in the system response of A and multiplying it by one half times the sum of the survival function at Q0 and at Q1. For Q2, we will integrate from Q0 to Q2, and the area now becomes the area of the first trapezoid from the prior slide, plus the area of this next trapezoid. So we take the probability we calculated at Q1, 0 0.008, and add to it the area of the next trapezoid. And then for Q3, Integrating from Q0 to Q3, we take the entire area we calculated for Q2 and add the area of the next trapezoid. This process continues until the full range of the hazard has been evaluated. In the prior slides, to solve the integral, we calculated the area under the curve, and we did so by using the trapezoidal rule, which divides the total area into trapezoids. Using the trapezoidal rule, the integrals can be expressed by the relationship shown here at the bottom of the slide. This is the same relationship that we used in the prior slides to calculate the area under the curve and solve the integral. This brings us to an example. We were given the system response for four potential failure modes, A, B, C, and D and we are going to calculate their adjusted system response probabilities assuming competing risk. The top table is the marginal system response probabilities. The second table is the complement of each system response or one minus the system response. Calculating the complement up front will simplify the final equation kind of like it did when we were performing a common cause adjustment. Finally, the third table is the solution to the example. Let's step through the process for failure mode D. To get the adjusted system response for failure mode D, assuming competing risk, we start by subtracting the system response for failure mode D at Q0 from the system response for failure mode D at Q1, as shown in the red box. Remember that the system response for all the failure modes will be equal to zero for hazard Q0. Next, we are going to calculate the survival function for both Q1 and Q0 and add them together. At Q1, the survival function is equal to the complement of the system response of A times the complement of the system response of B times the complement of the system response of C, as shown in the green box. At Q0, the system response for A, B, C are all equal to zero, and the survival function is one minus zero times one minus zero, times one minus zero, as shown in the blue box. Putting the pieces together using the equation from the prior slide, we get the system response for failure mode D at Q1 minus zero times 0.5 times the quantity of the survival function of the other failure modes at Q1 plus the survival function at Q0 to get a probability of 6.74 times 10 to the minus two. For Q2, we follow the same procedure, but everything shifts down a row. We will take the system response for failure mode D at Q2 minus the system response for failure mode D at Q1, as shown in the red box, times 0.5 times the quantity of the survival function of the other failure modes at Q2 in the green box, plus the survival function at Q1 in the blue box. We add that to the adjusted probability for the failure mode D at Q1 because we want the entire area under the curve from Q0 to Q2, not just from Q1 to Q2. This results in a probability of 7.02 times 10 to the minus two. We then repeat the same procedure for Q3. The inputs again just shift down a row. 
And then again, the same thing for Q4 and on down until we have calculated probabilities for each hazard in the table. For the other failure modes, the process is the same. The equation on this slide is for failure mode A at Q3. This time, the survival function will be defined by the complements of failure modes B, C, and D. In this exercise, we are going to use the same numbers from exercise 1.2, but we will use the competing risk model instead of a common cause adjustment. In the table, you have three different potential failure modes and space to calculate the complements, as well as to calculate the adjusted system response probabilities. Please pause the video now and work through the exercise. When you're finished, press play and I will go through the solution. First, we will calculate the complement for each marginal probability by taking one minus that probability. We take one minus cell C8. Next, we click the corner of the cell and drag the formula over and down to fill out the rest of the complement. Having the complements will come in handy in the next step when we calculate the adjusted probabilities. For PFM1, the adjusted system response from the competing risk model is going to be equal to the integral of the system response for PFM1 multiplied by the survival function for the remaining failure modes with respect to the hazard. The result of that integral, obtained by using the trapezoidal rule, is shown on the screen. For the first row of calculations Q1, we need the marginal system response for PFM1 and the complements for PFM2 and PFM3 at both Q1 and Q0. The probabilities for Q1 will come from the first row. For hazard Q0, shown as QI minus 1 in the equation, the system response for all failure modes will be taken to be 0, as shown here. Without the 0 terms, the equation becomes the PFM1 marginal system response times 0.5 times the quantity of the complement of PFM2 times the complement of PFM3 plus 1 because the quantity of 1 minus 0 times the quantity of 1 minus 0 is going to be equal to 1. The calculation for PFM2 and PFM3 will be similar. For PFM2, it is the PFM2 marginal system response times 0.5 times the quantity of the complement of PFM1 times the complement of PFM3 plus 1. And for PFM3, it is the PFM3 marginal system response times 0.5 times the quantity of the complement of PFM1 times the complement of PFM2 plus 1. For the second row, at a pool of elevation 733.7 .7 and coming back to PFM1, it is time to pretty much plug and chug. We take the adjusted probability for PFM1 plus the quantity of the difference in the marginal system response for PFM1 at this hazard level and the previous one. We're going to take that times 0.5 times the sum of the survival function at this hazard level and the previous. As such, the last term becomes the complement of PFM2 times the complement of PFM3 at pool 733.7 plus the complement of PFM2 times the complement of PFM3 at pool 728.4. Next, you can move your cursor to the corner of the cell and double click when you see the plus sign to use that same formula to populate the rest of the cells of the column. Now we'll repeat the prior steps for PFM2. The formula is the same, but now we use the system response probabilities for PFM2 and the complements for PFM1 and PFM3. We then move to the corner of the cell and double click to finish up the rest of the values for PFM2. 
Then repeat the procedure for PFM3 using the system response probabilities for PFM3 and the complements from PFM1 and PFM2. One last time, double click in the corner to use the same formula for the remaining cells and to finish out PFM3. And this completes the table. When done correctly, for a given hazard level, which is pool in this case, the sum of the adjusted system response probabilities will equal the same result you will get using De Morgan's rule, just like we saw for the common cause adjustment in exercise 1.2. While the resulting total probability will be the same, how that probability is distributed between the potential failure modes will be different. Here are the plots of the marginal system response and the adjusted system response using the competing risk model. As with the common cause adjustment, you can see that the probabilities for all three potential failure modes have been reduced. If you compare the results of the competing risk model to the results from the common cause adjustment, you will find that the probability for PFM1 is slightly higher in the competing risk model. You will also find that the probabilities for PFM2 and PFM3 are slightly lower in the competing risk model, but that the calculated total probability is the same. Now that we have covered each of the risk models, which one should we use? While in most cases the total risk will not differ much with the risk model used, the preferred risk model depends on the tools available and the level of accuracy required. If powerful software is available to perform the risk calculations, such as RMC Total Risk, the joint risk model will be the most accurate and is recommended. Simplifying assumptions can be made to estimate the consequences for the joint failure events, such as taking the maximum of the consequences between the failure modes, summing them together, or taking the average. If calculations are being done by spreadsheet and there are more than two or three potential failure modes, Use of either the common cause adjustment or the competing risk model is recommended. Of the two, the common cause adjustment is easiest to use and has been the risk model most often used in quantitative risk assessments. Use of competing risk is relatively new for dam and levee safety risk assessments and is used in the current version of the CORE's levee screening tool, LST 2.0. Keep in mind the accuracy of the estimate when using the competing risk model will be dependent on the number of failure modes and the number of intervals used to approximate the integrals using the trapezoidal rule. Depending on the spreadsheet, this may be a limiting factor. For screenings, or when dependence among potential failure modes is negligible with respect to both probability and consequences, the exclusive risk model can be used. This concludes module one of the course. Please be sure to complete homework one to get credit for completing the module. In homework one, you're given four flood load ranges and their probabilities, along with five potential failure modes for a dam. You are asked to draw an event tree and to use it to calculate the total failure probability. You are also asked to perform a common cause adjustment on the system response probabilities. You can do the homework by hand and scan it. You can draw your event tree using the drawing tools in Excel and use the spreadsheet to do the calculations or you can do some combination thereof. It's your choice. Once complete, please send your homework to rmctraining at usace.army.mil with the subject as DLS 105 Homework 1 to help us keep track of the submittals. Thanks in advance for your cooperation. If you have trouble with the homework, please reach out to the instructors through the email address on the screen. We will go over the solution to the homework assignment during the live question and answer portion which will be in a few weeks. Also, at the end of the live session, you will be asked to take a short quiz so we can give you credit for your participation. If you miss the live session, a recording will be posted to the website and the quiz will stay open until the day of the next live session, so you should have plenty of time to complete it. Please check the course schedule for other dates and times. Thank you for your attention and we will catch you next time.